What's going on, Matt? How's it going, Andrew? You didn't even give me a countdown like you usually do on that. You just kicked it right off. And usually you start. Do you see how I started yep, by saying that? Yep. Uh-huh. <laughs> kind of like it. That's what we get for doing an early Saturday morning recording session. Yeah, nothing better than waking up at 5.30 a.m. to do a podcast. Well, you know, we got the blood drive today, so it was easy to squeak it in beforehand. And, you know, we might get interrupted in a few minutes here by the mobile unit showing up to set up in the parking lot. But that's all right. Yep, excited. I'm scheduled to get some blood, but the thing is, is yesterday I went to the doctor and I got a tetanus shot, a flu shot, and they needed to take blood for testing because it was like my Ugh. yearly visit or whatever. So now I'm like, <laughs> both my arms hurt. I've already had blood drawn from right here. So then I'm going to have to get it equaled out so it's not three poke holes that I can get a four so both arms get two. <laughs> right, right. There you go. <laughs> fun, fun. Yeah, I'm donating as, as well this morning. It's been a while since I have. I should really get on a more regular schedule with that. I usually will donate at work. My work will do one, and it's like a good opportunity to get away from my desk. So if I'm just there, I'll be like, oh, yeah, I'll go and <laughs> I'll go donate some blood. How's yeah. the water thing going for you? The water thing is going well. So I think, and okay, there's no way I can prove this scientifically, but so I've been drinking probably three to four liters a day pretty consistently, mm. and I've been peeing a lot. So I went into the doctor yesterday, and I had been, my blood pressure medicine had run out like two weeks ago, and my blood pressure wasn't high. And he goes, hmm, well, maybe we should hold off on re-prescribing, because he goes, I don't like to keep people on drugs they don't need, and see what happened. And I looked between this blood test and the last blood test, my sodium was high, and now it's low. And I'm curious if that has to do with the extra water filtering out sodium. Probably. Which- I mean, sodium's essential, though. It's an essential mineral, so you don't want to you don't want to drop your levels too much. Right? It was still within, yeah. like, no, it was in like the green area, oh, like okay. low green. Whereas, like last year, it was like in elevated, like we're like you need to cut down on sodium. Right. And I don't think I've cut down at all. <laughs> <laughs> You're just drinking more water, so your system's flushing it better. You yeah. More of an equilibrium. Yeah. yeah, and so I'm curious if that might be like a nice, well, it is probably, that is probably in conjunction with a couple of things, but probably helping too. Yeah. I've been getting more sleep as well, and I think that helps a little bit. And yeah. So, yeah, we'll see if I can stay off those, but yeah, maybe, maybe no scientific proof, but maybe a byproduct of just being hydrated. That's awesome. That's good to hear. But I mean, when you think about it, your body's, you know, mostly water. Yeah. And all of its functions are basically started by water to a certain extent. Is water's always involved, so right, right. I'm, yep. a, I'm a water boy now. Hey, Bobby Boucher. <laughs> 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 I've been sitting at about ninety to one hundred and twenty ounces a day, so not doing too shabby. What's that in uh, real people measurements? Fluid ounces isn't real people memberships. How many? How close to a gallon is that? 128 ounces in a gallon. Okay, and how many ounces did you do? 90 to 120 a day. To like, yeah, like probably a like of water. three to four liters. Like yeah, which we're is, in that same range. Yeah, which is reasonable. I do think when people say that you should do the gallon, I go, I think a gallon feels like a little too much. And you look at it up, and they're like, just around, like, like feel what your body tells you. If you're right. working out, go up to a gallon. Like, if you really are sweating it out, but otherwise, yeah. Well, you know, it, it's not like that's the only fluid I'm intaking every day. So, you know, there's a couple of Celsiuses in there and stuff like that. So it, it makes it a struggle to get. The full gallon of water plus 24 ounces of Celsius plus maybe a adult beverage or two. <laughs> yeah, you only have so much room for liquid. <laughs> right. I've been feeling pretty good, but I also switched up my diet. So uh, doing multiple things at the same time, never less you at identify exactly which one is doing what. But. They're all doing it together. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. So, all right, well, I think we should kick this episode off. Let's do it. Loosen up your ties and roll up your sleeves. It's time for Fellowship with Matt and Andrew. The views and opinions expressed on this podcast are not necessarily the views and opinions of the Grand Lodge of Wisconsin or any other Grand Lodge or any appended body. All right, so today we were going to talk about a topic that I figured out when I was taking the 
courses that the Wisconsin's Masons page has for its members. So the education team at the Grand Lodge of Wisconsin has these really cool education programs. If you've not logged in to wimasons.org and you're a Wisconsin Freemason and set up your account and check them out, they're really, really interesting. Even, you know, I'm a fairly well-read Mason and I even was learning a couple of things while taking the courses. Yeah, but, no, those are just to, you know, reinforce what you said. Those are pretty good. There's a lot of good material in there. A lot of things written by voices you've probably actually heard on this podcast at this point. So, yep, I was doing I was reading one though, and there was a question that stuck out to me and Basically, I was reading one that was titled The Book of Constitutions, and one of its questions, so each one of the cool thing about these education pieces, too, is at the bottom they have questions that you can bring to your lodge for discussion. And I'm not going to read the article, but I wanted to read the question that kind of got my brain turning. And it said, Freemasonry from its inception has been thought of as a fraternity of gentlemen. Discuss how guarding our thoughts, words, and actions, both in our personal lives as well as with the Book of Constitutions, is still relevant to maintaining the character of a gentleman to this day. So that got me thinking. I said, I texted Matt and I said, you know, it'd be interesting. Are we still gentlemen today? Mm-hmm. And is it important if we're not that we should strive to be gentlemen? So today I wanted to talk about what a gentleman is and if it's important and how do we be gentle sirs. This I think this is going to be a fun conversation and I think it's been starting to get reinforced again that entire concept especially during well I don't know actually how long it's been going on now, but probably before most worshipful Dave Ritchie's year, he's had a column in the Wisconsin Masonic Journal for a while called "The Gentleman in the Room." Oh yeah, yeah, yep, yeah. I've seen that. You know, and it's usually it's usually topics relevant to you know why Freemasons should be the gentleman in the room, and you know, either different examples of things people have done or stuff like that that. Uh, you know, would exemplify that. Yeah, and I I think it's something that... So before we go down the rabbit hole, let's say what a gentleman is. And then I was about to say, especially in the age of social media and stuff like that, but I think that'll come out in the conversation anyhow. So a gentleman is traditionally seen as a man who embodies the qualities of courtesy, respect, humility, integrity, and kindness. Though historically, this term also kind of was referencing a man who came from a good family, so rich people, education and social standing, but over time has become more associated with behavior rather than background. So I would probably argue that in its inception when masonry was called a fraternity of gentlemen, as we know historically, it was kind of bougie at the beginning. I'm sure that was kind of enveloped within that. But on top of being wealthy family, highly educated and stuff like that, it has always also inculcated the behavior of someone from that class. And as we have modernized in society, the stigma of being like, you can only be a gentleman if you were a rich person from a wealthy family, like old money types, you know what I mean, has kind of withered away. But the behavior aspects of what a a good gentleman looks like is inculcated within the degrees of our fraternity. I'm going to disagree with you for once. All right. If you go back to roots of Freemasonry, right, you you had mentioned that it was kind of bougie at its, you know, and that's what you needed to be considered a gentleman, whereas I find it interesting that our craft started with more like the stonemasons potentially, and in its current form, at some point, it kind of got a little bougie, right? But, like, before it was organized in 1717 under the United Grand Lodge of England and stuff like that, it really wasn't. And I'm going to guess that people were still held up to the same general standards of gentlemanness prior to that by the fraternity. So it was almost an outlet for blue-collar men to be gentlemen, So potentially. It, historically speaking, it's very likely that the... Stone Masons Guild had a sort of code, right? But the modern code that we understand today was developed by free and accepted Masons who were wealthy benefactors right. of the Stone Masons Guild to join in. And so a lot of the modern philosophical aspects were more of an outgrowth of those men while taking what was already there as like a guideline and kind of adding to it. Fair. Which See, is, this is why I should never disagree with you because you know more than I do. Well, um, <laughs> 
There's a really good episode on the Further Light podcast talking about the development of the ritual, which was ah, fascinating. Yeah, I think I, I remember. I listened to too many podcasts, so they all run together, and my brain's so full of knowledge these days that every time I learn something new, it pushes something else out. Yep. And so in that podcast, they talked about how in America, it was usually merchants or upper class until after the Civil War. And at that point, they started opening the doors to more middle class and mm. upper middle class people. Mm. And so that's when, which I think was a good idea, because if right. you look at the lessons of the fraternity and then you say, but not poor people, then it kind of doesn't make sense. <laughs> like It doesn't quite. <laughs> it's like all things. You, sometimes the fraternity has to live up to its own ideologies. And I exactly. think that would be a step in that direction. But so to pull us out of that rabble, rabbit hole, in modern terms, your background has little to do with being a gentleman. It's more how you present yourself to the world and what kind of integrity you have. So it means treating people with dignity, you know, being honest, honorable, and the sense of civility in one's actions. Yep. So it's like a person who values fairness, self-control, and strives to, you know, make other people feel comfortable and respect. And I think you know, we just even a couple of those terms resonate with Freemasonry almost immediately. I'd say they they all do. I mean, we've spoken before about civility being kind of one of the hidden lessons of Freemasonry, and you know that rolls right into this whole conversation. Yeah, and and I think when I was thinking about you know what a gentleman is, I was trying to imagine who I've met that I would consider a gentleman. And a couple of people came to mind, and I don't need to list them all, but I, one of them is Gary Beyer. Oh, um, yes. Yep. And yeah. the key is, is what I was noticing amongst the commonality of people that I would consider a gentleman is the, the way that they put you at ease. Mm-hmm. No matter who you are, it's the way of kind of feeling empathetic and civil and considerate and really good manners and stuff like that. Yeah. <clears throat> And so you start to go, you know, why is any of this stuff important? And I think it's that it makes people feel just comfortable being around you, which kind of makes you a like a warm situation when people meet you. So it's like you're just a net positive at the start. You leave right. a good first impression. Right. I, I would agree with you there. And I, I think the list of examples that we could probably go through in this fraternity is quite extensive. I feel like I've met met a lot of men who live up to the standard of being a gentleman since yep. becoming a Freemason. So I, I thought this would be a good topic, too, because I feel like for a long time, if you look historically, I mean, everyone will look at the past with rosy glasses and be like, we had so many more gentlemen back then. Mm-hmm. And there was gentlemen and there were also not gentlemen at all times. Well, and there's there's a big movement currently to try to kind of bring that back to the forefront. I know it's it's not like huge at this point, but Juan Sepulveda from The Winding Stairs mm-hmm. has the gentleman's brotherhood that he started, Yep, which is... <clears throat> really good Facebook group and pretty much talks about how we can be gentlemen in modern society and stuff like that. And yep. I know it's got quite the following and it's been growing and it's a it's a very interesting project that he started there. And I think it's important that we bring it back to the forefront. I think it could actually help solve a lot of problems that exist. <laughs> and, yeah, I think a lot of like this this very divisive kind of hostile social situation modern era that we have is partially caused by the degradation of you know what i mean like this this emphasis like so you think in the past people had a lot to fight about as well <laughs> like you know people right. always had a lot to fight about oh yeah but there was efforts to try to make social situations more comfortable for people who even if they disagreed because there would be politeness involved right well we're talking about civil discourse there yep, yep. civility kindness respect where they'd respect pe- you know it's it's all kind of goes hand in hand so it would be like, I think it's very important that as a fraternity that has, from its inception, had a moniker of describing us as gentlemen, that Masons try to strive to also live up to that. Because I think that's a good avenue to help you improve yourself in Masonry, because that's a lot of the aspects of being a gentleman are the same as being a Mason. Right. Why don't we take a quick pause here for the mobile unit to potentially show up, and then we will get back into what exactly, like, some more specifics on what it means to be a gentleman. Yep, and we'll also touch base on some ways we can work to be a gentleman as well. Perfect. All right, well, now that we got the mobile unit set up for this uh, blood drive, we're back. Yep, we're back, and they're going to get all prepped for people to draw blood. Woohoo! <laughs> but yeah, so so the 
key aspects to being a gentleman are basically all the moral values of a Freemason with added decorum and civility, which I think are like, you know, we talked about the hidden virtues with Pat. Those are kind of in our stuff, but not uh, directly addressed. Well, and we've talked about civility being one of the hidden virtues multiple times on this podcast. Yep. And also included in being a gentleman is also presenting yourself well. So being dressed well for the occasion you're in. Right. Which doesn't mean always be dressed up. It always means look like you dressed on purpose for the situation you're in. It'd be like if you were going hunting and you showed up in a suit, they'd be like, this isn't the right stuff. They, Back in the day, it would have been. <laughs> yeah, but if you were, you know, based on the situation, having the correct gear for the situation, right? So if you're hunting, right. have nice hunting apparel to look respectful. That would have been like, like right. me wearing a long sleeve shirt and a tie and a jacket for a blood drive today when they need to be able to get at my arm and everything else. So I'm yep. here in a T-shirt, you know, which is more appropriate given the situation. Yep, the, and it's just like if you're going to wear it, like they say, like don't wear tattered clothes. Like look like – it's like basically whatever the style is, make it look like it was done with thought, right? That's right. kind of the goal. Right. But so it's kind of easy for a mason to see the path to being a gentleman because it is basically – all the moral values, which kind of should spill into a lot of these social interactions, but applied with a sense of the ability to speak respectfully and civil- civilly and maintain an air of decorum in social interactions. So it is very social based. Yeah. And, wow. you know, when you look at history, if you look at like not to not promote inside A or side B or anything else like this like that but if you look back in history and actually i recently watched a video of it of presidential debates you saw a lot more decorum and a lot more civility and a lot more gentlemanly behavior from both sides where they would explain that they respected their opponent and actually have a civil conversation with them yep they would do what the like a gentleman would do and say you know i have great great respect for so and so and but we disagree on this. And right. This is why I am a better candidate because A, B, C. He's like, and they, I remember in that video, there's one that says, "I think me and my run and my opponent both want to see America be a better place." We just but, have different ways of getting there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I don't agree with his ways to get there, and I right. think my ways are better. And you're like, yeah, and that's a good way to say we're not going to make everything personal. And I think in modern society, everyone wants to take things personally and make things personal. Yeah, I, I found it interesting when I was watching that that if you literally go back and like watch these you can watch a sudden just like and you watch more modern ones you can watch this sudden just total decline of civility in those conversations and decorum and gentlemanliness and all sorts of stuff and it's it's funny because it almost almost cues up where you really start seeing a hard downfall to that stuff about the time social media or just after social media started existing. Yep, you started to see a little bit more mudslinging in the late 90s. And like, but not, it wasn't excessive, but a little bit more. And then you started to see like it'd be a little more commonplace to take like a more negative stance. But it is, I think, I think social media has had a huge impact. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because now people are okay with civility kind of getting thrown out the window because you find very few people who are civil on social media and i mean i think there's been media influences to it too where they're they're trying to make it a group a versus group b type of thing versus a you know hey we might disagree but here's why we disagree and actually explaining the points well yeah and the the media portion too is the uh, monetization of outrage yeah so it's the idea that they're like Oh man, you know, we used to do nice, respectful news, but that didn't get us any views because we're so freaking boring. But then we started being outrageous, and you know what? We made more money. So now we need to maintain an air of outrage, which has also inflamed the fans. But I think, too, with the social media aspect, you kind of like people feel comfortable on social media because they're not face to face. There's a distance sometimes, depending on what platform, there's anonymity. So people feel comfortable shedding their decorum and just being animals. Right. And the problem with that is, I think, why it comes out of social media is because you kind of, you know, you are what you, like, practice. And so if you're on social media all day being, you know, an entitled a-hole, mm. when you end up coming back in the real world, it leaks out because right. you don't you don't set the habit. 
Right. Agreed. And, you know, it almost seems like a insurmountable problem to try to overcome these days because it is so widespread. However, I think the right way to start dealing with bringing civility and things like that back into society would be for there to be shining examples of that in the public. And I think if you live up to your Masonic values, you can actually be one of those examples. Yep, and I think being a the the philosophy of a Mason is super comparable. And I think it's easy for us to take that step of saying, I mean, that's like we talk about, bring masonry into the world, not in just keep it in your lodge. Right. So if you're kind, empathetic, respectful, civil with brothers, but you're not with people in the real other, you know, people, the profane, I guess it was, was sometimes you call <laughs> right. it, yeah, with yeah. the uninitiated in the real world, then what is the point of this whole thing, right? And so I think I like to always view Freemasonry as the dojo where you go to practice Masonic values with people you trust, and then you should hopefully make a habit of that when you go out into the real world. Well, we're actually we're actually charged to do that, aren't we? Yeah, we definitely are. Universal benevolence. Yep. You can go back to, I believe, the EA charge episode if you want to hear more about that. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, as in most of our episodes, where we're, it's me and Matt talking about a topic, not just us, uh, you know, rambling, where we try to actually talk about something. We try to find what are small ways, you, if you were endeavoring to say, I'd like to improve being a gentleman and try to be more gentlemanly, what are some things you can do, right? So, I compile the list. Of course you did. <laughs> so the first thing I, I pulled from a couple of sites, Art of Manliness is a podcast that has Ooh, a blog. Yep. And um, I, my understanding is the host of that is actually a Mason in Oklahoma as well, even though it's not a Masonic podcast. I need to, I need to dive into that one. I haven't yet. It's pretty fun. He's a lot of good thought-provoking topics. But so he's got a lot of on his blog originally about being a gentleman. And I pulled from there and a couple other places. So the first thing you can start to do to make an active effort to be more of a gentleman should be easy to understand. We should all already be doing it, but I know sometimes we don't, is practicing good manners. So please and thank yous, right? Right. Ma'ams and sirs. Ma'ams and sirs, if it's, if it's appropriate. If it's appropriate, yeah. Active, uh, listening actively, making eye contact, giving full attention to speakers. There's some issues with that with, with you know, cell phones. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. people are a little bit <laughs> weird with eye contact these days. And then being polite and courteous, you know, holding doors, offering a seat to someone in need, and using polite language. So practicing good manners. So even if you wanted to start small and just be like, I'm just going to really put an effort on always remembering to thank people. In the fraternity itself, I found that's very helpful because we're a volunteer organization. So right. thanks is our payment a lot of the time. Right. Well, <laughs> no, I think it's very important to thank people when they've when they've helped you accomplish a task, right? Especially in a volunteer organization. It, we're all here because we want to see our lodge succeed, right? So that the lodge being successful is thanks enough, you could argue, right? But having a person, especially in a leadership position, thanking you for your effort means a lot. Yeah, I mean, and, and oftentimes when the members of the lodge or your master of the lodge or whoever it might be goes above and beyond to do a public recognition, it can be huge because like it's a big thank you, especially if the work done is warranted. Right. Yeah, we don't pay people. So like that is is giving someone their due, which we talked about in another episode, yep. is vastly important. And I think it's a good way to kind of just build kindness between people by recognizing when someone's helped you. Right. I, I think the key is in your day to day life with this, just to remember just to to try to be nice. Just be nice. It doesn't cost you any more than it costs you to be an asshole. Like yep. and so why choose the path of negativity when you could choose the path of positivity? Now, as I've mentioned on a previous episode before, too, in certain situations you be nice until it's time not to be nice and then you be nice again. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about your typical day-to-day -day interactions. You should, for the most part, 99.9% .9 of the time, be able to be nice with people. Yeah, and I mean, that's the part, too, is, like, being a gentleman is mostly for fast interactions, too. Like, if you're talking with one of your buddies that you argue with, it's uh, not, I, you know, I get it. It's more personal, but it means that your first contact with everyone should always be maintained an air of kindness. Right. Which brings us to the second thing, show respect and kindness. Right. So this is one that I always think is interesting. It says treat everyone with respect 
whether they're a colleague, a waiter, a waiter, or a stranger. And I think I've seen, I've had friends before where I knew them, and then they were like an absolute a hole to a waiter. And I was like, you know, I think you just revealed a lot about your personality right now, and I don't like it. Like, yeah, no, I would agree with that, especially, you know, especially with wait staff, they got. They got a tough job, and yeah, okay, sometimes stuff gets messed up. But, you know, we're all human, and we all make mistakes. You know, if you've never made a mistake, then I guess maybe you can you can go off on somebody for making a mistake. But that means nobody can go off on anybody. <laughs> and, I mean, in the age of social media, we get the videos of the, you know, they call them Karens or, you know, whatever the guy uh, yeah, version is. Yeah, where people Chads. just Yeah, is it Chads? Chads. I don't remember. But <laughs> people just going ballistic, like the self-entitlement and the, and, like, basically adults having grown temper tamper, temper tantrums right that's like where you can see when that that quality has failed the other thing within showing respect and kindness is trying to avoid interrupting people and try to use respectful language most of the time so avoid crude offensive language and speak kindly even in disagreements now i would actually add an addendum to this where this is once again like knowing your space right if you're with your buddies and you guys are a little more crude and you like to have your fun and do that that's an appropriate place for the language right but like if you're talking to a random person like you should maintain an air of dig- decorum with strangers and with you know your buddies if you want to be a little yeah. more crude i mean that's fun right that's right. what we do well exactly and you know we we do a little bit of quote-unquote mudslinging with each other you know but we've developed that relationship where it's okay yeah you, you earn know. the right Having these conversations about interacting with people and decorum and all that always brings me back to a saying that I I believe it was my grandfather that always said it, and then my dad always said it. And it was, you catch more flies with sugar than shit. (laughs) Yep. And I think that's, that. I mean, that just speaks to it, right? If you are are nice and you have decorum and all those kinds of things, you're more likely to create an ally than an enemy you're more likely to maybe bring around somebody who's kind of undecided and not totally set in their opinion on something if you're having a civil discussion about something if you're nice the whole way through you have a better chance of bringing that person around to your side of the you know your side of the argument than you do if you're just belligerent yep well and i'm noticing too the trend with all this stuff is being a gentleman is about basically just being a nice guy to have around (laughs) right right so like the the next one suggestions were be honest and dependable keep your word masons know a lot about that keep your promises and commitments when you say you're going to do something do it be honest don't be a liar we all get that and uh, be reliable arrive on time be prepared and contribute positively to whatever that you promised you would do So, like, the reliability thing, like, yeah, everyone knows when they ask for help and the person says a time and they come an hour late that you're just like, this sucks when you're on the other end. The key is is making sure you're the person that is easy easy to work with, basically. Easy to have on, like, as a round. Right. And, well, there's always going to be stuff that comes up and maybe you're late once or twice or something like that. Or you miss it by, like, ten minutes because traffic was way worse than you expected or something, right? So there's always those mitigating circumstances. But if you are constantly late, you're you're not really living up to this part of it, right? Yep. And if you are late communicate right because then you can make the lateness less of a so the person's not staring out the window they're right. like oh i get it i'll, I'll start and he'll be here in a it's, couple minutes. it's less stressful if you know that the person is legitimately trying to get there <laughs> it's basically like being a gentleman is like a high level of empathy where they go i want to make sure everything i do isn't causing another person a net negative in any way right and so yeah the next one is dress appropriately and neatly we kind of talked about a little bit yeah. dress for the occasion understand what is appropriate for the a situation you're in, whether it's business, casual, formal, hunting, fishing, you know, dress correctly for what you're doing. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yo, I'm sorry, a bunch of different stuff just ran through my head, you know, show up to a hike with a difficult height with flip flops on, and you're like, oh my god, you're gonna fall. Like, you know, I was thinking about showing up for deer hunting in like a speedo when it's like <laughs> negative 20 out, like, yeah. <laughs> it's not gonna be a good day. Wear appropriate attire for the situation. If you know an event is business casual, show up business casual or above. If you know an event is formal, don't show up in a ripped jeans and a t shirt because you're gonna stand out. So, my theory when I'm going into an unknown situation where I may not know what the dress code is, and I know 
it's either going to be business casual or above, I'll throw on a suit because I can always take the jacket and tie off, maybe even roll up the sleeves on the shirt, and I'm business casual. Yep, it's good advice. The next thing is pay attention to grooming. Make sure you always keep yourself clean, showered, and your hair and beard and facial hair or anything it might be looking like you planned it. That you didn't wake Oops. up with it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Which, no. when you have a beard like yours, is more work. <laughs> it is a lot of work. Yeah, it takes a little bit of time to comb it and everything else. I I try to I try to stay on top of it, but you know, it doesn't always happen. Now, once again, these are ideals. They're not. They're not always like practical. Well, and we're we're rough ashlers. Right? Yep. But I mean, that's the key. Is is like so. And then they say choose clothes that fit well. Make sure your clothes is clean so that you show you respect yourself and others. So a lot of the dressing appropriate thing, like people always like to use the um, line that masonry is concerned with the internal, not the external qualifications of a man as like right. a justification to look like a slob. And you just go, no. It all because masonry is concerned with your personal aspect, your dress and the way you present yourself is a representation of the internal even though it's not always accurate it's still a good thing to do right i think the key thing to remember with it's the internal qualifications not the external is to not care if the dude showed up in a fifty dollar suit or a five thousand dollar suit that part doesn't matter (laughs) yep i get that and it's not that you'll be barred because you didn't dress up but it's like doesn't mean you should get a free pass on saying hey you should improve like right no i agree i agree you should dress appropriately for the situation what i'm saying is i think it's more of a monetary reference like it doesn't matter if the guy couldn't afford a beautiful italian silk suit and has one from kohl's like i do yeah you know it that part doesn't matter. Yeah, I think it's more referencing wealth and social status. It doesn't yep. matter. We're looking at a, a man's personal qualities. Exactly. But yeah, and so like I think this is important because it's a very fast way. I mean, if, if you're going to pick only this one, probably not perfect because you need to work on the internal before the external, but a very quick way to really up your first impressions is to look clean and put together and like you planned to be at an event knowing how to dress for the event Right. And it makes you look competent. Yep. I would agree. And, you know, as you as you improve those internal qualities, the way you want to carry yourself in the world will change in the way you want to look and stuff like that. I've actually kind of started thinking about wearing polos a lot more than T-shirts, and which is weird for me because I love a good T-shirt. I mean, it's one of these things where the more effort you put into looking professional, the more you are treated with respect because people assume that you have your shit together. Right. And so, like, even if, like, you know, if you're working in, you know, your backyard, you don't need to dress in a polo. But if you did and your neighbor saw you, they'd be like, that guy has his stuff together. (laughs) Either that or they'd be like... Why the heck is that guy working in his yard in a polo? Look What's that, wrong look with at him? That grandpa. <laughs> you know, and, and, and there's the there's the other side of it is you know if I wore a suit delivering Little Debbie, all my customers would look at me like I was crazy. But a polo's not really. They'd probably be like, oh, okay, yeah. he Maybe looks he's professional, stepping up his game a little bit, right? Yep. You know. So it that goes to dressing appropriately for the situation. If you're going to be totally out of place in a suit there's no sense in wearing it because it's going to bring the wrong kind of attention yep you want to bring positive attention right next on the list is demonstrating empathy and understanding that kind of goes through this whole thing like we're talking about be concerned how you're how you affect other people and their feelings and how the only way to build barriers between people is to try to understand another person's perspective even if you don't agree to understand their logic and go, I see how you came to that. I disagree, but you're not a crazy person. It's just a different perspective, right? Right. And to offer help when you see people struggling, offer a hand and, you know, be able to be a helpful person. Yeah. I mean, I feel like you should live your life day in and day out trying to put yourself or not trying to put yourself, but if you're in a situation to help somebody just to help them. I mean, I, I believe you're a big Letter Kenny fan as well. Mm -hmm. And one of the lines from that show, as simple as it was, that always stuck with me was, when a friend asks for help, you help them. Yep, I agree. 
Another part of being a gentleman is actually always trying to engage in self-improvement. Very Masonic. That means to... So part of it is to make sure that you... There's, there's. I saw this article I was talking about how it's entitled that a gentleman be able to in, engage in higher level conversations so they can talk about a variety of things so it can be more interesting to people from all walks of life, you know, that they have a broad understanding of things. Right. Which, I, which is just kind of extreme, but I get it where they're like, any man can talk to him about any topic and he is some... He can engage in a discourse with them to be pleasant, but it basically says to continuously learn, read, learn new skills, seek opportunities for personal and professional growth. So always tra- be improving. What's that line you say? Be, no, I thought you had a line. No, oh, that's your traveling line. Always, uh, be, always be learning and always be traveling. There you go. <laughs> From worshipful brother Tessier down in Florida. Yep. And then take time to reflect on your actions when you've st- you know stepped out of line. Make sure you catch yourself and go, all right, well, mistakes happen. Time to keep working on it. And then to be able to acknowledge your mistakes and learn from them, to be able uh, to have a lesson learned moment. Failure is never failure as long as you learn something from it. Yeah, then it's a, then it's a learning. Right. <laughs> you know, you can look at it as a, as a failure still if, if something isn't successful. However, you it's also a learning opportunity. And I think the key is to focus on the fact that it's a learning opportunity and sit back afterwards and debrief and go, what could I or we have done better in this situation that wouldn't have caused it to end up the way it did? Yep. And like, you know, if every failure is an absolute failure, then you're very naive to the fact that Every time that I've had like something go really wrong, I've learned like 25 lessons and go, wow, I learned right. a lot today. Yep. The next one is humility. A true gentleman recognizes his strength without boasting and is always willing to learn from others, was the line that I pulled. Ooh. Yeah, I like that And, one. you know, we've talked about humility a lot, and I think the, the strength behind that is letting your actions speak louder than your words is like pretty cool. <laughs> right, right. And no, I think humility is... We all have an ego, right? Yep. The more you feed that ego, the the bigger and more problematic it becomes. So it's important to stay humble, keep yourself on the level. Yep. And, Parting on the square. And pay attention to how your ego is driving your interactions with other people. Yep, and how you might be mad at someone for something that is just an ego-based thing where you right. just are like, maybe you're just annoyed that they're doing better than you, and you're like, mm, right. and that's not their fault. It's not something they actually did. It's something that that wolf, we'll call it, yeah. named ego, is f- feels offended and attacked by that is not necessarily some an actual offense. As if it's like the fact that they didn't do it is offensive because you got praise and they wanted the praise or something like that. Right. Yep. Yeah. You see that all the time too when you got big egos and it's 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 a good reminder too just to be like just keep your head down, do the work, do good square work and people notice. You don't need to shove it down their throats right. big. Oh me me me. It is very apparent when you are doing good work and you have a lot of strong character because people notice about you to begin with. Right. Exactly. The other big one is c- contributing to the community. They say it's incumbent to always as a gentleman give back to the community, volunteering your time. You know, charity works. We are all familiar with those. Kind of like we're doing here this morning with a blood drive. Woo! Be helpful in small ways. Pick up litter. You know, support local causes. Support friends, family, colleagues, and celebrate in their successes and commiserate in their failures. Ooh, I like that. Yep. And so, like, I mean, that's another... I mean, this is why I keep thinking, like, yeah, masonry is trying to endeavor to create gentlemen because a lot of these are sitting there in our lessons being like that's what we do we get back to the community we try to work on ourselves we try to dress up for meetings to give respect it is like teaching men these codes and i I was telling what i think i was talking to someone about not to bring it back to dress codes but i was like a lot of times men join the fraternity and they buy their first suit Mm -hmm. since their prom you know what i mean right and so now, you know, for a long time, they probably were invited to weddings and stuff, and it would make them self-conscious with, like, I don't really have a good suit. Like, yeah. And now it comes up every once in a while, and I that feel embarrassed. That was for a while. Yep. I, I had those moments, too, where I'm like, the suit sucks. I feel embarrassed. And then masonry forces you to be like, I'm going to make sure you at least have one good suit for our business, yep. ca- our business formal meetings so that when this moment comes up, not only do you have the suit, you know how to tie your tie. Like, <laughs> Right. And I personally, I feel like every... Anyone striving to be a gentleman should have one black suit in their closet. Yep. Because a black suit can be appropriate for any situation. You can pair it with a bunch of different shirts. It's a classic look. It's easy to work with. And if you have one well-fitting black suit 
and a rainbow variety of shirts that'll go with it because black goes with everything. Yep. You know, you need a black belt and a black pair of shoes and you're set. You're not looking at like a blue suit with a pink shirt and a brown belt and brown shoes and all this different stuff you're trying to put together. You can do many, many variations with one black suit and those black pants from that black suit can double as dress pants, right? Yep. For business casual occasion where you're going to pair them with a polo right and black suits wedding appropriate and it's funeral appropriate which makes it appropriate for everything in between there that you need to wear a suit to as well it's almost as if the black suit is the cornerstone of suits because you can then expand from there but you have your baseline right and i would argue too like when i got joined masonry i got i had a like a navy a dark navy close enough to black that i used in a similar situation right. and immediately i just went and got it tailored so i was like i just want to have one suit that is yeah. that is my bedrock that fits correctly right because we've all seen guys wearing baggy suits and a tailor costs 50 dollars. so you're like just invest in saying if you have one you can kind of you can subsist off that as long as you need and if you're not into suits that can just be your one and then if you like it you can also expand into other colors and right. do other things with it and great Exactly. Well, how many more do you have to go here? Because otherwise we should start wrapping it up soon. Just one. Very okay. easy. Maintain composure. Always stay calm, Ooh. even under pressure. Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah. But that one's also very hard to execute. It's, I think, one of the hardest. Practice self-control. Avoid reacting impulsively or mm. aggressively. Yep. We've all seen guys like that who are great at de-escalating a problem where someone comes up, they always stay down. You know, like, yeah. they're, they're, when they're in conflict, their main line is always maintained. We're like, I'm well, going to always stay at this volume. And, well, well, and one of the really fun things that we taught when I was a professional communication <laughs> skills instructor was if somebody starts getting loud, start getting quieter. Because it will almost, because most of the time they also want to hear what you're going to say, right? And yep. if you're quieter, it's going to start bringing them back down because they're going to have to try to listen more to what you're saying. It it works 50-50, but it can work. <laughs> well, and if you think about it, people assume that being aggressive is them controlling the conversation when it's really not. If one person always stays quiet they're holding the ground and they go nope this is the ground and if you rise with them it kind of gets out of control and that gives them an advantage because if you're both angry the angry person and the two people angry are on the same level right but if a man always maintains a cool composure they're in control because they actually have a better thinking process than the angry person so they're able to better address it and that harkens back to be nice until it's time not to be nice and then be nice again Yep, yep. And the other parts of uh, maintaining composure is apologies, making sure your apologies are sincere. So when you know you did mess up, own it. Don't run from it. Maintain your composure and your accountability. And then always make sure you handle conflicts gracefully. Address uh, disagreements calmly and constructively without resorting to anger and hostility. So kind of rewording of the same thing. Right. No, that sounds excellent. Yep. And so, yeah, I think... There is a lot of good stuff to be uh, kind of unpack with this, and I think it's a, a good reminder to brethren to try to live up to our moniker as a fraternity of gentlemen. I think we should all strive to be gentlemen every day. Yep. And yeah, so remember to always be, I guess what we like to do, last thoughts. Remember to follow the moral teachings of the fraternity, but maintain a level of decorum and civility, and you will find yourself being more like a gentleman. That works for me. <laughs> <laughs> well we gotta we gotta start wrapping up here you gotta give your donation soon and i'm not far behind you and i want to make sure they don't need anything out there cool well we'll be uh skipping news and events this week yep. just because we're doing some charitable activities we but- had a pretty comprehensive list at the end of last week's show that will at least take you through the end of september so if you want to go back and listen to that there's some good stuff in there so go give it a listen and we will talk to you soon. Take care, guys.